The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to Killer Innovations. Glad you could join us today. Uh, we're continuing a series of interviews that we are doing. These are all with individuals who have applied innovation in different ways to different uh, approaches. They may be, we've had analysts on this show. Uh, in this case, the today's uh, guest is really talking to the whole concept of coming up with frameworks and how do you innovate that and how do you turn that into a product or solution? We talk about the fact that you can have great ideas, but you got to execute. In today's guest, it is about having a great idea taking a wealth of experience, crafting it into a framework, writing a book about it, and then ultimately creating an online application that his clients use. So it's not the traditional, let's go build a widget or build a product. It is really about how do you commercialize an idea? How do you commercialize your experience, create intellectual property, turn it into tangible offerings, to build a business around it. So today's guest is Peter Learney. He's the founder of Solutioneering. Um, it is a, an organization that looks at the, the whole concept of how you craft and define solutions. Uh, he is the originator of this concept called Solution Engineering Framework. Um, he has written a book about it. And most recently here in December, they've launched this tool set as a, uh, as a cloud service. So you can sign up for it and try it out. It's all around critical thinking skills and critical thinking skills on uh, identifying the value of what it is you have, whether it's B2B, you're selling uh, something to another business, or B2G, business to government, you're doing big uh, contract proposals and that for government work. Uh, government work is a background that that Peter has. Um, he's a former officer in the U.S. Navy um, and uh, has uh, been working in both federal, state, local governments um, on large uh, programs and projects. And over that experience, is he created this framework on how to think critically um, about your your solution. The, the RFP, the proposal, to get you into the best possible position to win the business. And that is this whole concept behind Solution Engineering Framework or um, the, the tool set that in the book that he has written. So it's, an, it's a little bit of a different show, and it's about how Peter developed that concept, innovated the idea, turned it into a, a valuable process, Wrote the book about it and now has turned it into this uh, this uh, this cloud service, which you can do for any idea that you may have. So here's your opportunity to listen to an entrepreneur take an innovation and take it all the way through to where it is today as a commercial offering. Before we jump into today's show, got the favor to ask. So follow, like, and share. Follow us on social media. Follow uh, the show. Uh, subscribe to the show so you get it automatically delivered to you each and every week with each new episode. Like the show. It helps uh, raise the visibility, helps attract uh, new people to hear about the show, um, and then share. If there's people out there who you think can benefit from the show, talk about it. Share it with them. Send them the link. Post to your social media accounts. All of that helps us pay it forward. That's our mission and objective here at the Killer Innovation Show is to pay it forward share our experiences, share our guest experiences to help you achieve success. And we make this content freely available to any and all in hopes that it, you find it beneficial to the work you do. And with that, let's hop into this week's show. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. 
Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Peter, when it comes to complex deals, I mean, I've known you for a while. I've known your, your, the work that you've done in, along your career, but you've shifted into taking all of those lessons learned into solving the challenge of how do you bid and win? You know, you're, you've been involved in winning these, you know, winning deals, but you started off doing it as a very manual process. And then, Yes. Putting the methodology in place and then now putting it in, in, in a tool sets that people can take advantage of. And the listeners of the show, they've got their own ideas, whether it's, you know, they're going to innovate a new widget or they've created a new framework. So I want to back up because, I mean, you know, what you've shared is absolutely phenomenal when you think about engineering success and that's key to an innovator. You've actually applied it, and I'm going to give a hypothesis here. You've applied it to how you've innovated the solution earring, right? Because you started That's off correct. as as a as That's... a as a, uh, as a as a manual process and working it out and working with teams and helping teams win, and then you know your book, which we'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later here in the show, but then now your tool set. So talk back us up to the very beginning and walk us through how you innovated the the whole thought process and thought about applying really solutioneering to create solutioneering. Okay. We're all products of our experiences and we all create our, these mental models. Um, many years ago when I was a young man, I was um, an officer in the Navy and I was on ships. And on a ship, you have an appreciation that a ship is a system of systems and that it's, there's a lot of variability in terms of um, navigating and operating um, a warship. And so then when I started consulting, I was consulting in the Pentagon. And I was part of teams that would assess large complex weapon systems that were being developed. And very often those weapon systems were not hitting their cost schedule performance thresholds. And then I started to wonder why, you know, well, one of the root causes was, was that early systems engineering was not being done upfront. And so the uncertainty that needed to be squeezed out in development of that system was not occurring. Then when I was consulting in the firm I was with, I was also responsible for helping capture new business. And I just made a mental connection that it was very analogous between building a system a complex system and actually doing business development that included BD and capture and proposal planning and proposal. So when I was um, supporting capture efforts and proposal planning efforts, and proposal development efforts, I was using different parts of these mental models from my past experiences. And I started having success. One day, a man, a very successful man who's a mentor of mine, I consider a friend, encouraged me to put what I was doing down on materially on paper. Three months later, I came back to him and said, you know, so-and-so, I created this framework that answers the ultimate question, why us? Why would they pick us in a competitive bid from initially understanding the issues? And he said to me, Peter, you closed a gap in the market because the market doesn't show us how to think. And I was always held accountable for being told, when I was a consultant by the owner of my firm, we're in a thinking person's business. And when you're an officer in the Navy, you're held accountable for doing your homework to make sure you get things right. So I was always doing my homework. So I created a way of how you think, not what to do, but how to do it. Later, I, I brought all the considerations, practices, and tools and techniques that enabled that framework to make it um, effective. Okay, because you could think of the framework as just boxes of things you do and are in a logical order, but there's considerations and practices and tools and techniques that you apply when they're in there. 
And the reason I looked at it as a framework, because it's not set in stone. I'm always adding to it. Sometimes I'm not applying certain parts, uh, certain techniques based, based on situation. I applied that framework on nine deals in the past six years, and there were over $750 million worth of competitive wins. Then I was told, Peter, why don't you write, I, I teach a course around it, because I had all the body of knowledge, and then I just turned it into a book. Then in the past two and a half years before COVID, somebody pulled me aside and he said, Peter, why don't you turn what you've done into a software as a service? So we've done that. So now when I consult, I use this software as a service and I have a large audit advisory using it and a large, a large technology company just starting to use it. We just launched it in December. But now anybody can use it. And the patent that we have for the SaaS, it's we describe it as an analytical tool for collaborative competitive pursuit analysis and enterprise value creation. Because whether you win or lose a competitive pursuit, every time you use this, this, this tool, this software, your, the value of your enterprise is increasing. And because it's always capturing the intellectual capital of the users, and it's always creating a data lake of analyzed competitive intelligence specific to your firm. What's that interesting here, what it, what's interesting though is, is people like people think about innovators as being, you know, you know, I, 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 I create a widget, right. And I, uh, or a piece of electronics or whatever. And what you've really done is you, you reversed engineered how you were successful at applying a systems thought process yes, and created intellectual property in it. So yes. you've innovated the IP portion of it. And then you're manifesting that IP in a variety of different forms, whether that be teaching, the, the book, or the SaaS. That's right. And we even have a certification exam around the framework. So right now, um, I have people that have I've worked with in the past that sort of success of what I do. They're trying to adopt it in their own organizations. I got a couple of companies in California some here in the Washington care just starting out. So we're at the early stages where we've built it. Now we're in a process of just starting now the market awareness of what we're doing and, and trying to make it available to, to, to uh, industry. And it could be used in not only just the business to government market space, but the business to business market space as well. Well, th that opens up an interesting, you know, one question I have for you is, is there a minimum size to apply this or does it work literally on, I don't know, everything above a hundred million or is it good for a million or you got to be in 500 million to make this make sense? Um, set, as we call it, which is short for the solution engineering tool is a tool of tools. So within it, there's 61 distinct tools that can be used end to end, piece, part, or any combination thereof. And because of its design that way, it's sort of like your Swiss Army knife. It's sort of like your iPhone. We all use it differently. That if it was a, whether you're a large company with large and a large revenue deal, or you're a small company with do small deals, or whether the deal is a large deal that's a year out, or a deal that's six months out or a month or less, there is a capability in there that can enable your success. And set is not a, business intelligence tool, although if it's used the way it's designed, it will create a data lake of business intelligence specific to your company that reflect the strategies that you use to win. And it's not a proposal management tool. It's not a workflow tool, a knowledge repository tool, or a, a, um, a document that shreds proposals. And it's actually a unique capability that closes a gap in a market. It's a thinking tool. It's, a, it's an analytical tool for collaborative competitive pursuit analysis. It facilitates that collective thinking that you need to win a competitive pursuit. You keep saying competitive pursuit, but let me give you a scenario. You tell me whether or not you, you think the tool could apply in it. Cause I get this request a lot of time from listeners of the show or people who know me or whatever, right? They've got an idea. They think it applies to a particular enterprise. They're not being, the, the pursuit is not that company coming to them saying, submit me your thoughts or on how your solution applies, it's almost a BD effort of a cold outreach. Sure. So it's not a competitive piece, right? Because you keep saying competitive, but here's this, 
it's not competitive, but I know organization A over there could really benefit from what I've got. Okay. Would I? Could I use your tool to then think more deeply about how do I go pursue that with them, even Certainly. though they're not, even though they're not even aware they might they might even need it. Certainly. So first of all, um, if I was going to do that, what I would first do is what I call an issue analysis, as I described much earlier. I would do a key factor analysis. So therefore, I understand the problem that I want to help solve for that customer and why it's a problem. I understand I've identified those key factors that might be technical or management or personal or corporate experience related and why they're important to address those issues that need to, to address those issues. Mm -hmm. Then if I understand that, I could focus on, am I giving them something that provides real benefit realization and or risk mitigation? Because very often, many customers don't want to change. 70% <laughs> of the time, they'll stay status quo. So then it's a matter of, okay, you're introducing something new. And therefore, if I say, what I'm giving you, the other industry can't give you. I know how it helps you, why it's important, the benefit they've gotten, and, and the risk it mitigates. And I can show you I've done it successfully before. So now I have something of value I can give. Set also allows me to, if I know those customers and I have did the issue and key factor analysis, it allows me to capture psychographic information such that I can identify who are the, um, the decision makers in the organization or the influencers, who are the visionaries and the leaders, who might be a friendly to our company, admires us, or who might be an adversary, and who might be on, on making an evaluation decision on the panel. So it helps collect that type of psychographic information as I do an issue key factor analysis. And also applies that psychographic analysis in other parts of set as well. Well, it's interesting because, you know, one of the common challenges for any innovator is when you're coming up with something new is convincing early customers the value that you're delivering, right? And one of the challenges I see, you know, and I get these all the time, you know, people want me to introduce them to somebody or you know, take a look at a PowerPoint tech that they've got is they haven't been, they haven't done the rigorous thinking about what it is they got and what is it they, what's the benefit of that in the minds of a customer. And it sounds like in this case, and look, I'm familiar with the solution airing because you and I, we have got common friends and people that we work with. So I've heard about what you're doing, but that's why I wanted to have you on the show to get a little bit more in depth on this is, um, I like that idea of the, you know, not step by step, but helping people think more deeply about what is it they really have, what's the real problem, and where does that meet, and do they have something of value to go after and pursue that opportunity with, and that and that I think is 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 one of the one of the hardest things for people who aren't used to. Uh, trying to convince people to to latch onto or or try a new tool or try a new innovation in your case. And look, you you and I were talking before we started the show today. That you know you're off trying. You know you, now you've got your SaaS tool, and now you're bringing on early customers. So now you you've got a tool that you're trying to convince others to try to use. Right. I'm use yes, and I'm using that tool and I consult. And the truth is, is once companies who I consult to are see me using this tool, they're very quickly going to realize, hey, we don't need um, to use Peter anymore. We could do this ourselves. In fact, someone made a comment to me. A lot of companies who do competitive pursuits rely on a lot of third-party consultants to help them um, prepare pr pr proposals and develop proposals. And I always look at proposal managers as my customer. I'm doing the upfront thinking to give them what they need to assemble a compliant, compelling, and convincing proposal. And comments that have been made to me in quite a number of occasions were, once companies see what you're doing, they're not going to have to rely on those third-party consultants as much who are very often costly. And we have a, a number of criteria, um, a number of items that we've identified on how companies would have a co ha realized cost savings by using a tool. And just one of those 10 things is less and or better use of third-party consultants. 
which would result in um, cost savings right there. Because what do all third parties want to do? They want to keep you dependent upon them. Yeah, and that's always been the uh, the challenge, right? Which makes you either uh, a friend because if a consultant, if the third party consultants use your tool, right, they have a higher win success, which means they can charge a premium because anybody that uses them has a higher chance of a win success. So there's the positive. The negative is is those companies could come to you and use the tool and cut the consultant out completely, right? So you can either be a friend or you can be an enemy, depending on where someone's standing at the moment. And I think that if you're a large integrator and you're going to try to do a cloud migration against another competitor and try to beat them, um, that using the tool would allow you to have less dependence on third parties, but you always might feel that you need a third party. But when they do come in, you're going to be giving them what they're typically looking for, what they very often do not get. And therefore, when they do come in, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to be part of enabling a success. So they're still going to get credit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Good point. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, so let me, let me ask you a question. So when you started and when you first came up with the framework, right, and then you started applying it and in 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 pursuits with organizations you were either part of or consulting or advising, has has the framework stayed pretty solid, or have you taken feedback and and done much in the way of change, or has it been, you know, you know, pretty much the way it started off? The framework, the uh, all the pieces have been there pretty much since the beginning, although I just repositioned some. However, I've done things like, um, if you ever heard of Freight Tick's Pyramid, which mm-hmm. is a classic way of telling a story, I've automated Freight Tick's Pyramid. I could turn any technical guy into a storyteller. So, I, I mean, I'll send you an email, you open up the email, I, it's very it's very simple on how you apply the the, uh, the ask applying Freytick's pyramid in terms of using set, and I generate stories very quickly. That's just one of the sixty one tools in set. I'm putting a, a, a capability in there to do automatic generation of one page white papers. Right, I'm doing a capability in there to do future state analysis. So I always have ideas that I intend to add to it, but this is where I stand it stands right now. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that about the white papers or storytelling, right? I just had uh, someone demonstrate to me one of these uh, um, AI uh, copywriters. You know, you can use an AI tool to to do Facebook ads or, you know, uh, 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 YouTube descriptions, those types of things that are going to be highly engaging, right? This one was uh jasper.ai and uh the demonstration was is that jasper actually has a template you go in you answer these simple questions and it actually writes a fiction story around this theme and it's amazingly good and you can give it a tone of voice you can say well make this humorous or make this serious make this happy make this sad and it writes it accordingly, and it's a story that's not like a story. It's and it's and it's and you put it through a plagiarism check. Nothing of it's plagiarized. It's all original content, out of an AI engine, where you just put in some of your prompts and you write. I think you get. I think you get a little window of like three hundred characters to kind of set the the background of the story or what your objective, what you want the person to conclusion at the end of the story, and, and it goes off and it does this, and you're like, okay. Where does this end? Where you know when you when you talk about a, you know doing that, and you're automating that. And you think about the power that AI is bringing to it. Is there are we going to get to some point in the future where you just put in answer, you know, five questions and hit a button and out comes a out comes a proposal at the uh, no. at the other end? In that regards, no, because set is a thinking tool. See, man will always be in a loop. People will always be in a loop in the sense that um, the essence of creating 
the essence of solving a problem and providing real benefit realization to a customer or risk mitigation starts with taking context of your customer, the competition, and your company, and then dialogue, that, that intellectual exchange. What SET does is it allows you to, it provides tools to facilitate that dialogue, whether we're doing issue analysis or key factor analysis or discriminated qualification or formulating a win strategy or analyzing a technical solution or developing a, a, a staffing strategy and more. It facilitates that. Another comment that I want to make is, is that um, when you're using SET, what's happening to each specific company is there's a data lake of competitive intelligence being applied there, such that you'll be able to do at some point in the future, and we have a number of pre-planned product improvements uh, plan, uh, in place, that you might be able to say, when doing SEC DevOps against competitor A, and we won, and then which proposal strategies did we use? And then it would pull those strategies across all opportunities when you did SEC DevOps for, for that particular competitor where you won and give it the answer. Very often what I've learned is when people would say, well, this is the winning proposal, but you don't know how they got there. Yeah. What SET does is it provides a visual and a digital blueprint that federates all the thinking that answers why you, how did you get to that win in advance of it going into a written proposal? Well, does, like, does, does, does the tool also, do you do, uh, you know, postmortems to say this was our thinking, but we didn't win the deal. It can and be used that way. And why, and why did we, what, what, where did we get off track? But did we make a bad assumption? Do we have a, 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 a bad uh, upfront condition case that led us down a path that was not the path to win? Well, set is sort of like, uh, you know, you work hard, you get an income, you pay a mortgage, and over time you build equity in your house. So the more you use set, the more equity, more value you get out of, out of it for your enterprise. Now, if, you, if you're a large integrator, like $3 billion, $4 billion integrator, and you have a volume of contracts and say professional services that you respond to each year, and you might be doing dozens, and as you're doing them you know, over time, you'll be able to do that root cause analysis because that data is in your company's proprietary right. data lake. It's been my experience from companies that acquired other companies because those companies were successful, they were never able to repeat their success. Right. And that's because all the people, it was the people who had the context who had left the company. Well, what SET does is, is every time you do, you use it and you're creating those strategies, every time you're using it and you're, you're capturing also the intellectual capital of SMEs, like maybe a SME who's a SME on, on, on um, data cleansing or a SME that's an expert on cloud migration. It's always capturing the intellectual capital of those people on every opportunity you bid such that you can actually use it in the future, as well as go back and do root cause analysis to see what was successful and what was not, a, what was not successful right. on a win or a loss, because the data will be there. Right. Well, again, and then you think about you know, rigorous, when you're trying to do rigorous thinking, right? Um, you always have to be careful of, of uh, bias, right? Because you're, you're, yes. you're, you know, and how do you, how do you weave bias out of the, the, the thinking process so that you don't end up down these blind alleys that cause you to repeatedly lose? And it sounds like the tool, because you've got the thinking process through the whole effort, you can go back and look and say, ah, this is where we kind of, this was successful. This one was not successful. It was different. This made this assumption, this made, we had this bias or this assumption here, and this assumption was wrong. And now you can recognize that in the next deal, right? That's correct. But I always tell people that no matter what tool you have, it's not the tool that will make you successful. It's how you use that tool. So there might be different companies using SAT. 
each is, might be using set a different way. Okay. But what set is meant to do is to facilitate that collaborative intellectual exchange, that collaborative analysis to help you make decisions on strategies you apply, on, on, on who you might hire, teams you might partner with, and how you're going to reflect uh, the strengths or the benefit realization or risk mitigation that you're going to give to a, a potential customer to support, give them the evidence why they should select you and give you that $75 million contract. Yeah, your point about the tool, right? It's like, you know, a hammer in the hands of a master carpenter can make amazing things. A hammer for a weekend hobbyist, don't ask them to build the house. They might be able to, you know, hang a picture on the wall, but they're not going, they're not, they're, they're not going to go build you a, a 6,000 square foot mansion, right? So it isn't, you got to, you got to know the tool. You got to know how to use the tool and you've got to have the context and the expertise too. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, it, 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 and it's, uh, it's the same thing with innovation tools, right? I get, you know, I get quote queried all the time mm -hmm. about, you know, well, what tool set should I use to run a, run a great brainstorming session? Right. And you've, and you've actually taken the innovation boot camp. you know, uh, I've applied some of those principles in, in my thinking and, uh, the boot camp, you know, it's like, okay, the, you just, don't go to you, you can't go to Amazon, download the tools, and boom, think you're going to run a great brainstorming session. It takes a little bit more. You got to, you got to, you know, build up your, uh, you got to build up your muscle. You got to build up your, your experience. And I'm interested in this tool because, you know, from that standpoint, that, that collection, that the collective knowledge that you're aggregating because of particularly multiple pursuits. And therefore, when people leave or the, the mix of, subcontractors that come in to participate in a pursuit or whatever, you keep that collective knowledge. It doesn't, ev doesn't evaporate out the door. That's right. That's right. If you are, you know, in our market, at least um, in the business to government market, what a lot of companies want to do, they want to get acquired. So if a company were like, say, a $10 million company, $15 million company, and they started using this software, by the time they're a 60, $65 million company, say, just make believe they want to sell. Well, there's somebody with $65 million who wants to buy that company. And they have choices. There's many companies they could consider in the market. But when all of a sudden the company says, well, I'm going to describe they have a good run rate. They, they show well. They've got great past performances and things of that nature. And, but, and here's our winning proposals. But by the way, we can show you in a traceable, irrefutable, defensible, and explainable manner, a visual and a digital blueprint and how we got to those wins. That come the premium in that company now is increased mm -hmm. because the, the acquiring company realizes I can likely rinse and repeat success with that company. Where most typically um, you've taken the personalities out of it. Where most typically the acquiring company does not get success because the personalities are gone. Right. Right. It's the hardest part with, with any acquisition is the people keeping the people. And, the, and so what it's the value, the value is the people and you can't force people to stay in, 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 in post acquisition. Right. So while they're with you and you're using these people to help you win your competitive pursuits, whether they're a, a, a pursuit manager or a solution architect, Use of the tool is extracting out their value, preserving it, and people in the future will get benefit from what they did long after they're gone. So talk a little bit, you know, you put the framework together, you wrote the book. Where's the book available at if people wanted to take a look at the book? The book's up on Amazon. Okay. And it's also available um, on the website of our company which is sort of a, a long um, URL, but it's www.solutioneering.company, not .com. And I, I can make available the URL to you uh, later on. Yeah, we'll put, we'll, and we'll have all the URLs and the link to the book and all that in the, uh, in the show notes over at uh, killerinnovations.com. But I'm interested in, in now as the, the cloud service, the SaaS. So, um, how long is, what did it take to take all of the, because a lot of people want to, they've got a really great idea. They got this innovation, right? You know, you've written a book. I, my book came out 
a long time ago now, and I'm actually I'm in the middle of book two um, at the moment, so I'm back into the writing mode. Um, Which I'll read. What's that? I'll buy it and read it. <laughs> yeah, the new book is on the seven laws of innovation. Listeners of the show have heard me uh, talk about it. And actually, my book deal was a two book deal. I'm only seven years late in the second manuscript <laughs> at this point. I've been a little distracted lately. Um, but you're now moving it to, uh, you know, well, you've moved it to, you know, making it a, a, a SaaS service. Um, that's a big leap. I mean, people think it's just kind of, oh, you just put up some web pages and, you know. Not at all. And you put some, for- and you put some forms up and you put some data in, a little magic crunching in the, you know. And I used to be, you know, I'm a CIO, I'm a software engineer by training, right? It, it's, it's a big leap, you know, to try it's to. It's a big leap. Yeah. Well, we, uh, I'm a systems thinker. Uh, my, uh, one of our partners is a rock solid uh, systems engineer and software engineer. And we built this following sound software engineering practices. It's well modeled in a model based systems engineering tool. It's well documented. All the documents are do- um, there. And it consists of 2.1 million lines of code. Uh, we had it pen tested by third parties. Uh, it sits on um, AWS, uses two factor authentication, um, and then it gets pen tested regularly through AWS. And then um, my uh, large global audit advisory client, um, they are using it now on three very large deals. Um, two of those deals are each above 150 million. And they do the due diligence with their legal and their security people before they used it. So that's what they do for a living. All right. And they did it on, 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 on this software before they started using it. So I, I felt good once we got by that. Yeah. I mean, and people don't realize the scale and the amount of investment, you know, you could, you know, find some contractor who could whip some code together. Right. But you know, not if you're building a business around it. Versus you're trying to make a good demo, <laughs> right? You know, I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of innovators who've got a great idea for software. They focus on the flashy demo and they don't think about it as a as as a platform that they're going to build upon and turn into a real viable business. I have a, a company here in this area. It's one of the leading companies globally that does software parametric analysis. And um, a year or so. Uh, uh, Actually, eight, nine months ago, he did a software parametric analysis in our software. And he said, Peter, nobody could build this software the way you built it. Because the way we the approach that we've taken, it would be cost prohibitive. So he uh, he placed a dollar amount on what it would cost somebody to build what we had built at that point in time. We spent, actually, when I say we spent the past two and a half years building it, actually, the building of it started many years before in the sense that the thinking, yep. the analysis, the design. So only in the past two years, though, did we do the development. Right. And actually, when the pandemic came, it became very evident. You know, when the pandemic, everything stopped. Uh, People are not meeting with their customers. Uh, Opportunity or pursuit teams to win new new, uh, deals are not face-to-face anymore. And I think the hybrid workforce is here to stay and that people are not gonna be going into the office as much. So how do you get that same intellectual rigor that used to get in a conference room face to face? Well, this is what the SaaS enables. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the fact that you've got some form of commonality and it's uh, it forces the rigorous thinking. And the, the part of the problem with, with the, uh, the fact that we're in a hybrid environment is, is you know, we get, everybody gets a little bit of, uh, you know, what I would refer to as virtual burnout, right? You get a little tired of being on these calls all day long. So you stop doing the rigor. You're like, oh man, hurry up. We're coming to the bottom of the hour. Let's get this thing done so I can get off and, you know, stop staring at these screens all day, you know, versus, you know, in a conference room, I don't know when you, when people are together, when I used to do pursuits, on on big deals, et cetera, you know, many, many years ago uh, in the consulting practice, you know, you almost, you almost fed off the energy of the room. 
you don't get that energy. You know, I, you know, I love Zoom. Zoom is a sponsor of the show. Eric's a, a close personal friend. You know, but it's just it's just the the reality of the psychology of of collaboration. Um, and uh, you know, how do you do that in a tool like this or any kind of a tool like? Jamboard. I'm a bit, you know, Jamboard's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And I've demonstrated it on previous episodes of the show, on the video version of the show, about collaborating where you, you know, it's the virtual sticky note effect, right? When you're doing brainstorming and using Jamboard. Um, and it gets pretty good, but it's still not the same as being in the room together. I agree with you. Um, that's a very human thing, as you're describing. And I remember that doing that in, when I was a consultant. I believe that if you look at what's happened with the market, um, a lot of employees are uh, are not apt to do the long commutes to go into the office. The companies realize that they can reduce their overhead, their off their footprints, and they don't need as much square square footage, or that they don't have to fly people uh, to another city to be face to face for an afternoon to have that some kind of rigor. So I'm like you, I long for the old days and I, I see those positives of that. I just think that uh, the pandemic has been a shift. Technology um, has been at the right place at the right time and that we have a new future now. Yep, I, and, I, and I absolutely agree, absolutely agree. As we wrap this up, question uh, that I have uh, for you that I ask all my guests when they're on. So it's a little bit of curveball, but I, I did, and you know, I didn't give you the you this question ahead of time because I want to catch you in the moment, right? This show is all about innovation. It's about creativity. What what innovation? What technology are you most excited about that you think everybody should know about? So what's the what's it could be something fairly common, but what's the or something exotic? What's the one innovation, one technology that, that you are excited about that you think everybody should be aware of? Well, I'm going to use a little bit of, I don't know if this is on Gartner's hype curve, but I'll make this up. You had talked about earlier about 10, 10G, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I envision, a, I envision a day someday in the future where uh, Someone will be in front of a large screen, a child will be in front of a large screen. And now we're talking about the humanness of it. And I'm going to see a hologram of an expert, one of the best uh, teachers of mathematics who's teaching my kid. It's not over a computer screen, but it's the whole hologram and the emotion. And so the AI, so that individual will know my child will know their strengths and weaknesses from that interaction because that hologram is learning as my kid is learning. And then that hologram is conveying to my child how to understand everything from eventually basic algebra to love plus transforms, right? So that's what I I envision. And when you think about the movement that's occurring in the country away from public schools, you can actually have that one-on-one education as a service to households where people subscribe. Now we want people, kids to be engaged in a very human manner, but I think that that 10 G is going to transform education in ways that we, we can never imagine. Well, it's interesting. 10 G I said, right. Well, the, I'm know, thinking way out. Yeah. The, well, you know, and in fact, there was an article that just came out this week in which I was interviewed for, around this concept of the, the 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 10 G which is 10 gigabits right well in in Austria you can buy 10 gigabits to your home today fiber optic you get 10 gigabits symmetrical broadband service don't have any way to use it you know you could have I don't know something like 4500 4k TVs in your house and you still wouldn't you know be a two and a half gig um so uh, but this, this, this capacity of broadband is exploding and what you're describing a little bit, albeit I like the idea of the holographic display, which is what we now refer to as, as a light field display with the AI. So it's a two way interaction. It's not a passive. I'm just looking and watching a very interesting image, but it's that, it's that machine learning loop 
feedback loop so that the AI adapts to whoever happens to be sitting in, in front of it. And for those of you um, that are interested, you can go out, go to YouTube and just search for Cable Labs Near Future. There's a series of four vision films that I, that I produced. And one of them is called Play. It's about gaming, gaming in the home. Watch that because you'll see a little bit about what Peter's talking about with Einstein. So Einstein on a light field display is teaching a high school student about relativity. And it's a full 3D holographic Einstein and a two-way interaction between the student and Einstein through this. Now, it is like way out there in the future, right? This is a futures film. It's not about what you could build today. It's about what could be possible um, to do. But the one thing we didn't account for that, that Peter, I, like, I really like Peter's ideas, is the closed loop. It's not just teaching and then you don't like it, so rewind it, listen to it again. Peter's point about taking advantage of that machine learning and, and looping it through. Interesting concept. Very interesting concept. So, Peter, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time and joining us here at uh, on the show. And uh, Thank you, Phil, for having we'll, me. And we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch and talk to you soon. We had a great conversation here with Peter. Peter shared with you his experiences and in the effort it took to develop the framework, to write the book, and then ultimately to create the cloud services. The one topic we got involved in that I, uh, in retrospect, wish we'd probably spent a little bit more time on, which was the role of artificial intelligence playing out in the uh, the uh, potential for overtaking the work of his tool set. Peter nails it. You know, we, we, there's a lot of fear about AI taking over people's jobs. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen at the rate uh, that people think about it. Uh, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on what Peter shared, what I shared. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think that uh, um, it's something that uh, is going to happen? So let me know. Also, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on uh, Peter's idea on the holographic that he shared right at the end of the episode. So you can drop me a note over at phil at killinnovations.com, or you can post a comment to this, this uh, episode. You can just find that over at killerinnovations.com. Uh, before we wrap up the show, again, want to thank you for your time. We, I know it's uh, the most valuable asset you have. And you chose to spend it with us, and I do greatly appreciate that. We're always on the hunt for guests, topics, questions that you might have. So again, drop me a note, let me know, and we'll weave that into the upcoming show schedule. As I've shared many times before, the reason this show exists is because of Bob Davis, my early mentor. Uh, the person who took me under his wing and really got my career kickstarted, really put my career in on um, with uh, the jet fuel and the afterburners. Uh, without Bob and Bob's advice early in my career, um, I'm not sure I would be where I am today, and I greatly appreciated his investment. Mentoring is important. If you don't have a mentor, I would encourage you to find a mentor who can commit the time um, and effort to, uh, to work with you. And, uh, but when I later in life asked Bob how I could pay it back, he laughs. He goes, you can't pay it back. You have to pay it forward. And that's how this show got started back in 2005, where season 18, uh, I can't even believe it's, uh, <laughs> starting our 18th year of doing this show. And we average about 40, 45 original episodes each and every year. We are the longest continuously produced podcast in history, and we hold on to that uh, label and credit with pride. Uh, we're here most every week, 40, 45 of the shows a year, and uh, to uh, help provide the best information, the best insight on unleashing your creativity, your ability to innovate, your ability to be uh, able to change the world with, with the ideas that you're working on. So go out there and change the world. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Podcasting nonstop since 2005. 
This has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.